Thanks as always for the continued support from the great folks at Pendleton Whiskey and what a great time to pour. The official beverage of According to Flint for episode number 64. You know, when my career first started, one of the biggest thrills I had was going to early PBR events and having the opportunity to share the arena with legends like Tuff Hiedemann and Cody Lambert and Jim Sharp and Michael Gaffney and this guy, the 1985 PRCA world champion bull rider Ted Noose. But on top of that, the statistics he owns, 14 consecutive years to the NFR, three years in a row as a reserve champion, four years total as the reserve champion, just a legend in bull riding to me and honored uh, to do this podcast with him and something else he's very passionate about, about his boys who get every opportunity he can give them to be rodeo stars. So enjoy episode 64 with Ted Noose. But first, this from our friends at Montana Silversmiths. Life is made up of so many moments, big and small. Sometimes the best memories are just time well spent together. Only time will tell what our most cherished moments will be. Montana Moments. Celebrate what matters. Well, welcome to another episode, episode 64, actually, of According to Flint. And episode 64 is the legendary bull rider episode, apparently. Uh, welcome, of course, the 1985. Holy cow, 1985. World champion bull rider Ted Noose and his technical director Wyatt and his entertainment director Weston. How's that? Good titles for those guys. Yeah. <laughs> Ted, which which one's uh Ted, which one is more entertaining? Tell me, tell me <laughs> about your Ted, tell me about your boys. Talk about them a little bit. Uh, they're both pretty entertaining at times. They can uh they can do some stuff that I that makes me scratch my head. <laughs> <laughs> that's their job right i mean that's oh, our kids job they I, I i it's amazing i love them more than anything on this earth at the same time they can make me more mad than anybody. <laughs> well I, I, and i think people should know when i reached out to you and i sent you some messages and one of the last messages i said is hey if your boys want to wander through that'd be great and i'll tell you why and i think I think this will probably make you happy and you're going for it. What we're friends on Facebook and I follow everything you do. And it's gotten where to me, Ted news, they're just an extension of you. When I see you, you're always with those boys. You you're giving them every opportunity you can give them. Aren't you? I'm all in. I, you know, I same was when, when I was riding bulls and rodeo and I was all in, I'm all in for these two, uh, it's just, that's how it is. You know how it is. Look at your daughters. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. And that's what you, it's the old cliche thing. You want things better than what you had it or whatever. But, um, what about when you, so how old, uh, why, how old are you? Wyatt? Uh, I'm 17. Weston, how old are you? 15. 15. So, ooh, what a nightmare. <laughs> 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 cool. Um, compare what they're, Compare the opportunities they have with you, dad, compared to when you were 15 or 17 differences, similarities. What, tell me about that. I, uh, I had a passion to ride bulls and I, I, I started figuring that out by the time I was 14, I went, I'd been on one bull and I went to Larry Mahan school and in Lake Comanche, California. And I'd been on one bull and I got on about 14, 13 or 14 bulls at that school. And the last bull I got on was a bull. His name was Paluto of uh, Bob Cook's RSC. And this bull had been to the finals and he turned back right in the gate. And I only weigh about 115 <laughs> pounds. And I, I don't know how, but I managed to stay on this bull. He turned back into my hand. He whipped me out and I'd whip in there. And, and I stayed on him and it's like, you know, that was, that, that, that was something that really, it just made me love it. Let made me love riding bulls. 
And Whiting and Weston, I put them on calves and at a much earlier age than I ever thought about ever riding. And I, I did it the right way. I, I put them on stuff to build their confidence. And it's a, it's a, it's a staircase to the top. It's an elevator down, but it's a staircase to the top. And if you, you go slow and you work on their confidence every day, and that's what we do. We build confidence every day. That's, that's my goal was to build their confidence a little every day. Then we're, we're eventually going to get to the top of the mountain. And I just, you know, I'm all in for them. If, if, and if they tell me, Hey dad, I don't want to ride Bronx. I'm going to say, you know what? Good enough. We're done. It doesn't matter to me. I want them to live out their passion in their life because it was so good to me. Hmm. But really, in, when you say you're building their confidence, you're building their confidence in more. If, if they say tomorrow, you know what? We're going to pursue something else. You've built their confidence in them that carries over to everything. Exactly. You know how that goes. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, if 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 they have the main ingredient, passion and want to, they're going to achieve anything that they want. They're, anything that they decide on, they know how to do the work. Well, I kind of keep up and you got them. You, you put them on calves. They ride saddle Bronx. Now I see the other day, there's videos of them picking up. Uh, what about time to vent stuff? Why, why are you a time to vent guy too? Oh yeah. We do. We do calf roping and uh, team roping as well. Uh, so where do you, what do you guys, I'll ask, I'll just ask you why are do you high school rodeo? Do you go to junior rodeo? Where does, where does this all culminate all this work? What do you do? Uh, right now we're not really going to any rodeos. We're, uh, just mainly practicing and, uh, really refining what we're doing. Uh, but I will probably be going to some high school rodeos this next year. Uh, yeah. My girls were big high school rodeo, but the big, the big difference is in Montana, the, um, high school rodeo is kind of the outlet you'd be, you know, Ted, before we started recording, uh, you were talking about you live in an area and that's why a lot of, you know, Montana ropers go to Texas. Cause you can freaking rope and go somewhere every single day. You're in a great spot for this, aren't you, Ted? Oh, it, it couldn't be any better. I mean, we're going to Tarleton today to get on the smarty bucket machine and we can take our Bronx over there and I can put them on Bronx over there or bulls and there's pickup man, gate man. Everybody knows what's going on. And it's not, you know, it's, it's like a perfect situation. When I was young, I, you know, I grew up in a family. My dad was a rodeo announcer. I have a brother that's a rodeo announcer. You know, we were around rodeo. You just mentioned where you were going to get on a smarty bronc. And we'll talk about that. I never got that fever or that urge to rope every day because when I it, make same way, when you were young, you just got put on a horse, they'd run a steer down the arena and you'd I had ropes and reins and trying not to fall off. And it was full speed. And it kind of scared me and I didn't want to do it. The tools that are given young people. Now it started with like the heel matic You can go at a walk and rope off a horse and a, everything is their speed. I, this past weekend, I was with Ryan Mapston who kind of invented the smarty bronc dummy, the resources they have, you just talked about it. You can build that confidence at their speed, right? Yes, sir. Um, the when when we talk about that, we'll we'll give it a little ad here. The Smarty Bronc is something that pulls behind like a, a four wheeler, a side by side, and it really simulates at their speed. It's pretty accurate about what a horse, a bucking horse, does, isn't it? Oh yeah, it it felt it felt really good. Uh, it has weight movement and lunging forward and. The way it drops, it feels really good. What do you think? Is that your event? Why? You a bronc rider? What are you? <laughs> I'm an all around. I don't do just one thing. I got to do them all, but I do enjoy bronc riding a lot. Weston, Weston, what about you? What's your deal? Uh, I do them all the same way. Uh, it's all fun to me. <laughs> but it, but again, yeah, you're, you're avoiding, and, and the term I use, Ted, because, you know, uh, our friend Cody Custer has been big on getting bull riders started at the right level. And like Cody always said, you take them somewhere and they get dick slammed four times and they never want to do it again. 
No, that's right. You, so, um, when you, you were the 1980 rookie of the year. Okay. I'm going to ask you guys it. Guys, what do you know about your dad? Why, what's your, it does, does your dad, I'm getting the impression he doesn't tell a lot of old re-ride stories and about what he did. Am I wrong? Or do you get some good ones? I mean, every now and then I'll, he'll be talking to his friends and uh, a story will pop out and I'll be like, where'd that one come from? I never heard that one before. I was like, I want to hear that. So yeah, sometimes they'll pop out of nowhere and you just don't expect them and you'll be like, I haven't heard that one ever. I don't remember that, but uh, there are some good ones and some ones I probably still haven't heard, but I'll hear them eventually. I bet. No, there, no. Hey, why Weston, let me give you a little tip. There are some you're never going to hear <laughs> ever. <laughs> Ready, yes, sir. Um, so what do you know about your dad? Like, you know, he was, he, in my mind, I'm kind of be, I've been through some generations of bull riders when I first started. So when I, start my first one of my first pbrs ted was 1996 oh, so wow. that was kind of right at you were just finishing up right yep. mm -hmm. so boys to me he's a legend just dad are you aware of kind of his standing in this bull riding world well I'm, we're definitely aware of the standing but it, he's mainly just our our dad teaching us what to do and we're like well yeah, you kind of know what you're talking about, bull riding, I guess. <laughs> you might know. <laughs> you know, when you, Ted, when you try to tell your kids something, like if I tried to give my girls tips on roping and they'd look at me and go, come on, dad, you know, and they were probably <laughs> right. But you have the advantage of being dad and being a world champ. Do they give you that eye roll? Like, oh, dad, <sighs> you know. Well, because we're creatures of habit and the way we learn is through repetition is they, I have preached it for so long to them that they like, come on, dad, we get it. We get it, dad. That's like, well then do it right. <laughs> <laughs> um, was, Hey, when you, when you won the world and that's a huge gold buckle behind you, that that's, that's not actual size, by the way, gold buckle. Uh, um, was that the, it had it moved to Vegas or was that the last year in Oklahoma city? No, that was, it was 85 was the first year in Las Vegas. Uh, 80, 84 was the last year in Oklahoma city. That's right. Um, I, I remember being a kid and we'd watch the NFR on TV every year from Oklahoma city. Yeah. And when it moved to Vegas, I thought this is ruined. Like this ruins my whole image of the NFR. Being a guy, you finally win the world. It's in Las Vegas. Did it have a different feel to you growing up watching it in Oklahoma City? Well, what was so exciting about the move was we went from $4,000 go-rounds to $8,000 go-rounds. And so I had competed three years in Oklahoma City at the national finals. And so I was very excited about the money doubling and moving to Vegas. So uh, I don't get me wrong. I love Oklahoma city. That's where, you know, when I, when I started, that was my goal to, to qualify for the, the finals in Oklahoma city. But once it moved to Vegas and, you know, all the, all the glamor and the lights and, and so many people the being one of the greatest sports arenas, maybe in the world, I, I feel like it's a great place for the national finals rodeo. I the, Right now in, in my mind and people have brought it up. Well, you know, Texas is going to try to get that NFR. It's to me, it's synonymous like that. It, it can't be anywhere else. Can it? it that's right. where it is. Just think of the spotlight, man. The spotlight is always on Vegas. They're always, you know, there's more money out there than, than anywhere else, and it just keeps getting bigger and better every year. I, I love it because if White and Weston, if they are going to pursue and be in this 100%, you know, in the next four or five years, you know, it'll be a real opportunity for them to make a really good living at rodeoing. Yeah. 30. Now, it, it, I'll tell you, the $8,000 a go-round in 1985, that was huge then, wasn't it? 
looking oh. at what what it was. Yeah, I mean, four thousand to eight thousand. It was like they interviewed me. You know, they because I they interviewed me in uh in eighty four about about this, mm -hmm. and uh. I told them, I said, for $8,000, I will run, because they were talking about how small the arena is in Las Vegas. I said, for $8,000 to go around, I'll ride him in a box stall. <laughs> God, we've discovered now, you know, you go to move to Vegas, the arena, that was the big thing. I, I do remember, well, mostly of what I've heard looking back, how small the arena is. Now, I get it for Bulldoggers, you know, the time event guys, okay. but we've we've discovered you know when we do the pbr in albuquerque the arena is like 70 feet by 68 feet and those bulls never buck harder than a place yep. like so who cares for you right right that's exactly right um you uh it's it's interesting to me when i look at your statistics and i'm not a big stats guy i i didn't realize until recently you were the reserve champion four times. You're the Buffalo Bills of <laughs> uh, Is that when you look back on that, you know, I could compare it now. We have in the PBR who's retired now, Galerme Marchi. He was yep. that guy that he just, when he finally won, he just cried and cried. You won first and then mm -hmm. reserve. What do you remember about those years? Was it frustration? Did you make a run at it and just miss it? Talk about being a reserve champion four times. I, it was really, it had a lot to do with my mindset. I was so, I was really satisfied to achieve that goal when I was 24 years old to win it. And then after that, yeah, I, I rode at a very, very good level bull riding was easy for me okay and my self-talk was like this and and i'm i've preached this to white and weston already if i win another one i win another one it was like look you will not beat tough edelman lane frost and jim sharp with that self-talk you understand what i'm saying mm -hmm. if you're saying that kind of stuff to yourself you will not beat those guys because those guys rode great they were great bull riders. You know, I mean, I I look at Jim Sharp, and I think he's the most talented bull rider I've ever seen. He mm -hmm. just did not fuck off. And Tough is probably the toughest bull rider I've ever seen. And Donnie Gay's the winningest bull rider I've ever seen. You know, so in those years, you will not beat the best having that kind of self-talk. Yeah. If I win another one, I win another one. That's what I told myself. And look how close fourth three years in a row. Hmm. I rode in the year Lane won the world. I rode eight bulls in a row. My la I beat Lane in the average that year, and but he won enough money in the go rounds to pass me. Yeah, 86, 87, 88, three in a row. But I know what you're saying. Well, if I win, I win. And those guys, yeah. okay. So you got Donnie Gaze, the winning at Jim Sharp, the most talented, tough, the toughest. You miss Cody Lambert. What's he? The grouchiest? What would Cody Lambert be? You know, you know what I love about Cody <laughs> is Cody helped Lane Frost, Tough Heedeman, Jim. He helped all those guys, mm -hmm. and like I mean, really helped them. Yeah, that's what I you know I've always respected and and really had we Cody and I've been friends for a long time, and his integrity. If Cody tells you something, that's exactly how it's going to be. He entered those. Didn't he enter everybody? Even when he was done, he was oh, still entering guys. Ty Murray. I forgot. Ty That's who Murray. it was. Ty Murray. He, he entered when he started out. Yeah. He, yeah. It's, yeah. Cody was retired. Yeah. And still. Yeah. What about these guys? Do they get help from Cody? Does Cody Lambert ever, is he one of your resources at all? Oh yeah. Cody's always there. If I have something. Ty Murray has, we've been going to Ty's Brandon since they were little kids, little. And Ty has told them every, um, work every event, boys, work every event. Yeah. And that's, that's why they work all the events. Yeah. What do you guys, uh, I would imagine, and either one of you, Wyatt, I see a lot of pictures, you know, swimming with Ty Murray. I mean, 
Oh yeah. I, it, it doesn't, even when I'm around Ty Murray, it doesn't always have to be about rodeo to pick up what his life is about. You can learn stuff from Ty Murray. I would imagine just swimming in the pool. Oh yeah. He's very competitive. We're, <laughs> yeah, very competitive. We'll go over there. I'm like, all right, let's see who can do the best backflip or gainer or whatever. And we're always competing and trying to just do stuff fun like that. And we're seeing who we're racing. We're racing. We're seeing who can do, be the best at certain things. And you can tell that he's definitely a very strong competitor when he was riding bulls and all his other. Things. He's he's raced Weston several times, foot oh, yeah. race, and they had a pinky arm wrestling contest one time. And he had a contest with Wyatt on the unicycle. Oh yeah. <laughs> the unicycle deal. Yeah. It, you know, we, we used to have these debates that reminds me back when I was coaching and I remember being a track coach and we, there was about five of us coaches on the bus uh, and at me, going to meets, we lived in Haver, Montana. So it was a long ways everywhere. We used to have this debate about what's your definition of an athlete. Some would say, the guy that's not truly gifted, but works his way to the top. Others would say, no, the guy that's naturally gifted. The one that I liked, and it reminds me of Ty Murray. Tell me if I'm right. You could have a, you could play darts and he'd beat you. You could go bowling and he'd beat you. That's Ty Murray, isn't it? No, he's going to, he's going to put out 110% no matter what it is. Yeah. And you better bet him because he's not going to quit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you were talking about all those guys rodeoing in the like 87, 88, 89, in those years, it, you know, Cody Lambert on this, he was on this podcast and he told me, you know, in, in all the talk of Lane Frost and what the, the general public knows about Lane Frost because of the movie eight seconds, he said the guy that got screwed in the deal was Jim Sharp. And reason being they were making a movie. And they needed excitement, but Jim Sharp never bucked off and he never talked. So it didn't fit the movie. So they didn't put him in there. That was kind of razor, wasn't it? Oh boy. Yeah. He, he just, he, he let his ride and do the talking, man. He didn't, he didn't have to talk. He rode so good. He didn't have to talk. The, the wasn't there a year he rode like 92% something. I mean, it wasn't really a stat at that time, but even you, you guys could take off rodeo and get on a, what could you count? Was there a rodeo count back then? Well, when I, when we, when I first got into the PRCA, I rodeoed with Jerry Beagley and there was no, you could go to as many rodeos as you want to. And when I was rodeoing with Jerry, we went, we'd enter like 150 rodeos and we got to close to 150 rodeos because we were trying to beat Donnie Gay. Donnie Gay, was in an airplane and he was entering you know that many or more rodeos so i don't think that number of rodeos came down till it came down to about 125 probably somewhere well maybe maybe around 85 you know they 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 started limiting rodeos because they were thinking that some guys are just gonna enter all these rodeos and they're gonna beat you because they have more money or they have more access or whatever it, it was, but they, they slowed it down and, and they, it went to 125. Then I think it went to a hundred. I don't know what it is today, but, uh, I, I, I feel like, Hey, if the guy wants to rodeo that hard lady. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of on your page on that deal. Um, it, it's nice. And I think rodeo is kind of the same way today difference in I'm a rodeo fan. I'm a PBR fan. I think good bull riders are good bull riders, whatever. The, the pro well, it's, it's it, not a problem against the organization. The problem, if you're riding on the elite level of the PBR, if you get in a slump a little bit, you can't Ooh. ride, you can't ride out of it because uh -uh. you're never getting on a bull to be 81 or 77 and work on something. When you're rodeoing hard like that, even to this day, you can go to a couple rodeos where you get on some nice bulls and get it back here. Can't you? Oh boy. That's exactly right. And that is so important, but like what you just said, they don't get that chance unless they go home and get on some bulls in the practice pen. And that's one thing that I see Jose do a lot is get on in the practice pen. What do you see in him? You're about the same size as Jose. Wouldn't you be pretty close? 
Yeah, I think he's just, uh, you know, he's a very highly motivated uh, bull rider that that wants to get better. And he works at it all the time. He don't he don't go home and not work on it. He goes home whether he had a good a, a good bull riding event or not. He, he's going home to work on it. I, I hear young guys go, I just need to go home and golf and not think about it anymore. I, no, that, that's not that's, how it works, is it? No, sir. I, I wouldn't do that. Uh, who else do you, do you pay attention? Do you watch PBR much on TV oh, or pay attention? Yes, sir. Uh, I had a discussion recently uh, on a show I just recorded with Clint Atkins, one of our announcers. <laughs> and we talk about different guys and their tendencies. Dalton Castle. Do you know Dalton? Yes. You know who uh -huh. he, the guy, what do you see when you see a kid? And I love Dalton. I've done PR work with him. I think he's funny. Uh, he's very, very likable. He can ride the hair off a 92 pointer and buck off an 84 pointer. What do guys, you know, his homework score is bringing down his test score. You know, he's got to ride more of those. Is that, is that here? What, uh, is it a, a mechanics thing when you see something like that happen? Help me out here. I just feel like, uh, you know, you always got to be working on something. I, like if you're having trouble with a nice little spinner, then go get on some of them. I mean, you're not going to go get on those 90 pointers and practice on them, but maybe just maybe it's his adrenaline or something that really kicks up or really sparks him when he's got one of those 90 point bulls, but it, it needs to be that way all the time. I don't know what it might be, but it's probably some little mental deal that he doesn't even realize that's going on inside of himself. That's causing that. And I would go work on it until I figured it out. That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to say Dalton's going to think I'm singling him out. I just really like him and he's number four in the world. He's number four in the world. So he's good. You know, he's not in trouble. Just curious. I'll tell you somebody else that, that I've been around a little is uh Daniel keepings. You know, I, yeah. I've known, he was a little kid and I used to go over and, you know, give him a little advice here and there, him and his dad, when his dad was alive. And like, I told Cody Lambert this like four years ago, I said, Cody, keep your eye on this kid because he gets on a lot of bulls. I mm. told Cody that at, at Fort Worth, whenever they were having a PBR there and he was riding. And mm. uh, I said, he, he, his passion for this is he's got a lot of passion for it. He gets on a lot of practice bulls. He gets on a lot of practice bulls in, in practice pins around here and the bulls buck and he, he, he doesn't back down. He gets on them. And, you know, whenever you start to really work on your mental game and you start to win and your self image, you know, comes up and it, it gets above where you were and things start to happen and you start to feel good about yourself. That changes everything. Yeah. You were right on that kid. I never, you know, he came around in the team thing. They said, we got this Daniel keeping. I'm like, who the hell's Daniel keeping? Yeah. That, now I, his name is Daniel keeping at 90, you know, cause yeah. he was riding stuff last fall and we just look at each other and go, who is this guy? But you're right. I, I think, uh, you know, a great basketball player shoots baskets every day every and, day. you know, bull riding physically is a little different, but, but here, um, what about you, can, you guys? Oh, go ahead, Ted. Sorry. You can work on your mental game every day. Mm -hmm. uh, Wyatt, uh, you got a, you're, I know you're a bronc rider. Your dad's a bull rider, but you got a favorite. Who do you watch? If you're watching the PBR, who's a guy that makes you slide up as a young person, slide up on the edge of your seat and get ready to watch? Uh, Jose every day. I like, I love watching Jose. He just, he's got great form. He works hard. He just everything that bull riders would strive to be because he's perfected like all the little things he works on the basics and he mm. it obviously shows. You know what else he's got? It's great hair. His hair is <laughs> always you ever notice that? He takes his helmet off and it's just one day he he kicks his helmet, you know, and he does the big thing. And I took him his helmet and I patted him on the head and it was just hard with gel. He had so <laughs> much gel in his hair. Anyway. <laughs> Weston, what about you? Who's your guy you watch? Jose. Yeah. Um, do you guys, I'll ask you guys since you're, I like getting young people's opinion. You're friends with Ty Murray. One of the, oh, yeah. possibly the greatest cowboy of all time. Do you think we're on our way 
to watching the the greatest cowboy of all time in Stetson Wright? Well, I got to leave room in there for us, but currently. (laughs) Well played. (laughs) Doing really great right now. I'd say yes, sir. He's doing a great job in all his events and uh, bull riding, bronc riding. So, yes, sir. He's doing good. Weston, you think so? You like Stet? You like watching Stetson? Yes, sir. I love the energy he puts out after he gets off a bronc or a bull. Anything that he does, you got to watch because that might be one thing that you need to perfect and get better at. Yeah. Ted, I think he's one of the greatest bronc riders I've ever seen. I mean, he's Uh a great bull rider, but you know, Bronc riding, I think, is a little different. I love watching good bronc riding. All those right boys from their dad, they have a real long stroke to get to the front end of a horse. I think that's what it, you guys are working on bronc riding. There, I'll be at the NFR and people will say, oh, yeah, these right guys, they get two extra points because they're two points better. They just get way to the front end, but you can really judge a guy in the bronc riding different than bull riding, I think. I think Stetson Wright is unbelievable bronc rider, Ted. He's awesome. He, uh, you know, I, he's, he's, he's worked at it mentally, physically, and, you know, he's as close to perfection as you can get right now. You know, he, he he's loving it. He's on top of his game. His attitude is perfect. You know, he's going to be tough to beat for a while. Yeah. Uh, physically, speaking of physically, how do you, how do you make it to the NFR and the bull riding? Not just 14 times, 14 times in a row. Like when I see that about you, that I, that's still, nobody's touching that. Are they? I mean. It's just, it was all passion, man. I just, you know, I, uh, one, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. One time in Salt Lake, this would have probably been about 87, uh, a little bull called Uno, he turned back to the right and he had some pretty good belly rolls. And I opened up and started spurring him. Well, when I did, he rolled me to the outside and he clipped me alongside the head and knocked me out. Rob Smets and Miles Hare, they were there. I was had it split between my finger and my rope slid on his side. I'm hung. And this bull, I'm and I'm knocked out. And he takes off with me down through the arena and they're chasing him and I'm knocked out and uh, I go to the hospital and and I had got a severe concussion, like severe concussion. Mm. And my head the next day looks like the size of a basketball. Well, two days later, I'm up at Salinas. And I mean, I'm still dizzy. You know, I still get dizzy when I raise up. But I, I felt like this. If I'm breathing, I'm getting on. That's how much passion that I had for riding bulls. It was like, if I couldn't ride bulls, I didn't care whether I lived or not. That's how I felt about it. Hmm. Cause to go that many years in a row, everybody, it seems that everybody looking at it now has this year where they say, you know what? I broke my, I broke my ankle in August. Going to miss the NFR. I tore my knee up in January or in, in July. You know, there's always something for you to go that long in this event and never miss an NFR. If when you really start breaking that down passion or not for you to not have some, a cast on something in 14 consecutive years blows my mind to me. I think, I think that's as great of an accomplishment. Listen, you're in the hall of fame. Great. You won one world title, but you went 14 freaking times in a row. That's hall of fame stuff to me. That's crazy to me that you did that. Well, I just, you know, I, I loved it. It God bless me. You know, he took care of me and uh, I, I just got to live out something that I really loved and it just kept rolling. You know, I never, I never did. I, I never got up in a, a day and thought to myself, boy, I sure wish I could do something else. Was that in the, in the seventies uh, growing up, was it part of the culture where you were from in California? Was it kind of every day? Cause you're, you're a native of California, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity that White and Weston have. I mean, I, when I was uh, when I was a kid, I went to uh, I could go somewhere and rope every day. I, I qualified for the high school finals in the team roping before I did the bull riding because I roped a lot when I, I like I roped every day when I was a kid. Yeah. So I was around it, but I wasn't around it like 
I wasn't exposed to it like they're exposed to it, to the great Cowboys. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just didn't. But I had that. It, it was something that about riding bulls, like I couldn't make a living team roping because I had to rope against guys like Ricky Green, uh, Walt Woodard, uh, you know, all, all those guys that were from out there at that time were that you went to a jackpot. And if you weren't like, you know, six, three times in a row, you weren't going to win nothing. And it was that tough because yeah. there was no numbers game back then. It was like, they showed up, the green showed up, you know, like Daniel and, mm -hmm. and Chris and, and his family and Ricky and, and all their, their tribe. And they didn't rope with outsiders. They only rope with their family. You didn't, and out box, you know, them guys, they, they got your money. They always rope good and it was mm -hmm. tough. And I told Walt Woodard one day, I said, Walt, I'm going to ride bulls. And he looked at me, says, you're going to get hurt. And I said, no, Walt, I'm going to ride bulls. <laughs> California was it. The, California was really where team roping took off though. That That's oh. the, the, I mean, yeah, team roping is team roping, but California in the day, was where it really snowballed and gained momentum with it. As you start naming all those names, I mean, that was it. Leo, Reg, and Gerald Camarillo. Camarillo. You know, that's yeah. where it starts. Yeah. Well, do you rope still? Do you rope much? I, I rope a little bit, not that much because I, I'm usually working the shoot for these two guys right here. <laughs> um, you, you're, you're in on the, in the first few years, I told you before we went on, I thought of when I think of you, for some reason, there's something that stands out. One of the first PBR main tour PBR events I did was about 1996 in Portland, Oregon. And I remember standing there and I was nervous and I'm watching the opening. And this is what I was joking about. You're not getting any pyro today. And remember it was one of the first places I'd been with all the flames and they were introducing all the bull riders and I'll never forget standing there that day. And it was tough. Hedeman, Jim Sharp, Cody Lambert, Aaron Seamus, Ted noose. I just remember I caught the end of that era. I think it, such an honor. And at the beginning of my career, I caught the end of that, the beginning of the PBR, the way, and it was a lot to do with Jerome Robinson and his production that was, that was a thrill then, wasn't it? With what they were doing ahead of their time. It was, uh, it was just amazing. You know, uh, the stars all lined up for us. We had, we got TV, we got Bud Light, you know, we had, uh, first we had Sam Applebaum and then we had Randy Bernard come on and things just fell into place. And it really worked out well for bull riders. It was, I, I used to say about Randy Bernard, he could throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall and go with <laughs> what stuck as far as ideas, because there wasn't a standalone bull riding event on every corner. So it was aligned. You, you guys, as, as a founder of the PBR and what you guys wanted to do, you were in a situation, not that there wasn't the rodeo was more the competition, but to put all those guys in one spot, people, people knew you. It was, it was an all-star cast there. It, it would sell tickets, you know, it, it sold tickets. And that's, we realized that a long time ago. And uh, we felt like, you know what? People might pay money to come and see us. Yeah. Uh, the guys that I've had on here that were, part of that founding group of the PBR, whether it's Lambert or, or Ty, or I, well, yeah, Ty, Cody Custer's been on probably others. I can't remember. I always kind of ask them real quick in that room or that wherever you were discussing this, give us a thousand dollars. We're going to do this. What was your fee? I always ask them, what was the feel? Were you confident? Did Jerome Davis, we talked to him about it. Were you confident? Was it like, I can spare a thousand dollars. If I lose it, I lose it. Uh, or did you have a really good feeling at the time? I felt like that all of us guys saying, just signing the paper and saying, we're only going to bull ridings that are sanctioned by the PBR. That made me feel pretty good. I mean, we had the best bull riders in the world and we were all going to stick together. 
And that's really what what I feel felt best about. Scary though. I mean, you guys were stars, you guys were stars in rodeo. A change is scary. Yeah, but it was it it was well worth the the risk. Well wow. <laughs> <laughs> that possibly I've always said in 15 years. Like I think, oh, Michael Gaffney was one of them. He's been on here. G Man had like the the canceled thousand dollar check from the PBR. And it was like 15 years to the day when the big sell and payoff, the greatest return on a thousand dollar investment in the history of man. Oh man, unbelievable. <laughs> So listen to this. So I had a I had a trailer business out in California. I had a commercial lot that I bought, and I was selling uh, diesel pickups and uh, horse trailers and and whatnot. And I'm back in Oklahoma, and uh, in Medill, Oklahoma. I'm I'm fixing to pick up a couple of trailers in Medill, Oklahoma, and drive them back to California. That a pickup that I just bought at the auto auction. And I'm in a restaurant and Ty Murray calls me and says, Ted, we just sold the PBR. And I said, Ty, don't be BSing me. <laughs> no, Ted, we just sold the PBR. It's like, I could, I was like, oh my God, I couldn't. I, I kind of had an, 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 an idea that, you know, that things were looking good for us. So I left that restaurant and drove to Stephenville and rented a house got my driver's license, did everything that my accountant told me that I needed to do because I was leaving California <laughs> long before. <laughs> so you, you knew right away, you knew right away to get out, a plan. to get out of California. It was, did that have to do with how much they were going to take of what you were making from the PBR? Exactly. <laughs> Great, great commercial about California, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, people followed me too. Uh, did uh, so tech because does Texas have a state income tax? Is that one of those or no state tax? Fellas, listen to your dad. <laughs> <laughs> that had to sit. I wonder what did you ever figure? By the way, never, I don't think I've ever asked anybody. I'm, I'm looking at Logan on here, all the founders, what the actual check was for. I have an idea. I won't ask you, but have you ever calculated what at the holy crap, I got to move to Texas really fast. So I'm a resident of Texas. Did you ever figure out how much that saved you in tax? About 400, 400,000. It saved you. Yeah. Paid for that indoor re part of that indoor arena. They built those boys. <laughs> Oh, uh, what a great endorsement of your home state, Ted. Gosh, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> I love California, but let me tell you, I will, I will not move back. Yeah, I've, I've never lived in California. I'm not moving back either. So, um, you, you know what else? I always think of Ted Noose on the PBR. What about, uh, you were kind of one of the first I remember. You were in an old Wrangler commercial. Weren't you getting down on a bull in the bucket shoot? Yep. That was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, that was pretty fun. That I, that I just remember that was my first, what one of your commercials was where I find I went, wow, they use cowboys. They're making them TV stars. Now. I thought that was a big jump. Yeah, we, we were in, uh, Vernon, Texas at the rodeo. And that's where we made that commercial Wrangler did. And, uh, the bull that I sat down on was, uh, uh, Cowtown. Oh, oh yeah. 18. You know, he was, he was bucking bull the year. He was mean. He's really mean. And I said, look, nobody opens that gate today. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I wasn't going to do it for, you know, the TV. I wasn't going to get on Cowtown unless they were going to pay me a few more dollars. <laughs> yeah. They couldn't just run in some, some yep. Angus muley bull that nobody would have known the difference. Nobody. Yeah, exactly. And the bull that I finally came out on was a, was a Bramer bull. that didn't buck, but I didn't want, I didn't want to get on Cowtown for nothing. 
Uh, a few years ago, real quick, you were the the coach, and now they have now there is a team series of bull riding with coaches, and a lot of the friends that you have are involved in that. But you were the coach of the uh, the USA Wolves team, right? The Native American, uh, yes, sir. Team, man, there's some. Uh, you know, I growing up in North Central Montana. So I, I grew up around a lot of the, the Indian kids up there around Browning, Montana, so much talent out there that's either untapped or it's tried to tap, but it, it sometimes you, you just want to give those kids a chance and see them go out and beat people. Cause there's a lot of talent on some of those reservations. I guarantee you. And it, the, the, the problem that I see, it's mostly mindset, you know, you've got to really change the way you think. And if you're going to really be able to make a living and survive at this game, because it's really tough. And if your mindset's not really correct, then when those tough times come along and you're not, you're not into it, you're going to go back home. And I see that a lot with the native kids that when them times get really tough, they don't want to stick it out. But if their mindset was changed just a tiny bit to where they had a, a real good coach to help them through those tough times until they really got it figured out, you'd see a lot more of them at the top. Yeah. That coach, that Cody Jesus, that, that kid's a, he's the real deal. He's a tough kid. And I, I have a lot of respect for him and he's really talented. Yeah, I love Cody Jesus. What is you don't mind me asking? What's your what's your Native American heritage, tribal affiliation, or what? What are you? Well, I was adopted when I was two weeks old, and and I used to, you know, I I, I don't know this to be a fact or not because I never knew who my dad was. I I ended up finding out who my mother was, but I always was told as a kid that I had Blackfoot and Cherokee, so that's I that's what I know. Hmm. Yeah. I, and it, like I said, gr growing up up here, it always interests me. I have a, a lot of friends up here and anyway, um, uh, boys. So you got a brand new indoor arena out there. I've seen it. I've seen pictures before I let you go. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but you know, your dad's maybe a little older dad than some of the other dad got a late start. But tell me, this guy's done – he works hard for you guys, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. He he puts out all the effort for us, and uh, sometimes we, we probably don't seem like we appreciate it, but we do. It might not, we might not act like it all the time, but we do appreciate it a lot. So, yeah, he definitely puts out 110% for us and whatever we want to do. What it, Ultimately, what's your, what's your goal um, – Whatever you end up doing, your dad's going to be proud of you, but you're, you're all in just rodeoing right now, aren't you? Oh yes, sir. Totally. Just all in on rodeo. And that's pretty much it right now. What about you? Little one in the back. <laughs> what do you want to, if I, it, okay, pick an event you, and I said, you can be a world champion in, in any event you want. What is it? All of them. I can't, <laughs> pick, I can't, I just, I'm, it's it's too tough i love them all uh good for you guys good for you guys well listen ted i appreciate it you know that and uh i sounded like randy corley right there you know that <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah when I, I i just i like having you know this is i'm kind of wrapping up in the arena too and but when i look at the the generations i was with ted noose and tough hedeman and then it was you know, Michael Gaffney was right there. And then it was, it was Justin McBride and Chris Shivers. And then it was JB Mooney and now it's Jose. It, I've got to see a lot, but it all comes back to those first times that I stepped in the arena and it was you guys. I am, I'm a fan, man. Always been a fan. Me too. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. All right. Thanks a Thanks, lot. Buddy. Thanks buddy.